Well, welcome back to the final lecture of this series. Finally, we're going to get to now, after all the trauma and invasion and uh, storm and drong, we're going to get to how we heal. The general concept that we're going to look at is that the inflammatory response, which we looked at very carefully, constantly needs to replace injured or dead cells and tissues. And this includes infection and trauma, surgical intervention, virtually every form of injury or invasion. And then the healing process, which we need to follow, won't happen and can't happen unless we get a completion of that acute phase, unless the inflammatory response and whatever immune response there was has finished, done their job, and paved the way for healing to begin. We have a couple more definitions that we need to look at, and that is the definitions of regeneration versus healing. And they're important distinction. The more highly evolved the species, the less we have a capability to regenerate things that have been lost. So it's the ability of cells and tissues and even organs, in some cases, to grow and then replace in their entirety the cells, tissues, and organs. Replace them. For example, we've talked about the limb of an amphibian or the tail of a lizard and the arm of a starfish. These can all be lost completely and a fully functioning replacement uh, will take place as time goes on until the animal looks like new. In mammals, this is severely curtailed and it doesn't happen very often. We can regenerate the liver, we can regenerate the kidney, and what this is is a really refined process of compensatory growth rather than true regeneration of the organ, but it works. There is a speed of liver regeneration after injury that's quite astounding. If you have to resect a liver after, for example, a car accident where it's really mashed, you'll take out all the damaged liver, stop the bleeding, sew things together, and you may have only 20% of the liver left. When that liver begins to regenerate, it will grow so fast that it will exceed the growth rate of any malignancy known to man and it will refill the space it previously occupied. It will definitely look abnormal, but it will be roughly the size and shape of the liver it was before. And if you look here, this is actually the biggest gland in the body. This is what the liver looks like under the diaphragm and at the top of the abdomen. If you left, were left with only this much liver, you would fill this whole place in probably several months. Unlike um, malignancies, this organ knows when to stop, will not metastasize, and will not spread anywhere else. It will not invade. The hematopoietic system, uh, the epithelium of the skin, the GI tract, all the ones we've talked about can maintain a state of constant renewal as long as they have enough stem cells. And if you remember, they had these niches very near the organ so that these stem cells went up into the skin, these stem cells went up into the colon, and these stem cells went up to cover the eye and replace lost tissue. And eventually, as I mentioned on day one, our whole body is replaced. You are no longer the audience you were when you arrived, and I'm no longer the teacher that was here when we started lecture one. Healing is a different response. Healing is a tissue response to any injury of any kind, including surgical, again, bacterial, traumatic wounds, or the cell death in any organs or inflammatory changes that cause death. And most human tissues, the vast majority, heal by scar formation and then restructuring without um, any regeneration. It's characterized by two distinct phases. First, the regeneration of whatever cells are going to be in the process, and then scar formation. The scar formation is the hallmark of, hum hallmark of human healing. And the different tissues have different uh, mechanisms and capacities as well. Skin, for example, heals mostly by laying down that molecule you've heard me mention many times called collagen. And collagen 
is so strong that if you took an equivalent strand of collagen and one of steel of the same size, it would be no contest. The co collagen is much stronger. Uh, the myocardium, the heart muscle, cannot regenerate, as you know, and it has mostly collagen scarring too. Now, this has opened up a whole area of very active research. We're not anywhere near being able to take a determined myocardial stem cell and make a new heart yet. I have great hopes that someday we will. However, what the research is doing now is looking at the possibility of taking some partially differentiated stem cells that are determined down that line toward myocardium <clears throat> and injecting them in the area of damage in experimental models and seeing if that stem cell can be encouraged to grow and replace myocardium. Different kind of healing from scarring. Liver inflammation elicits one response, which is fibrosis. If a patient has hepatitis or chronic cirrhosis, inflammation from drinking, they heal by scarring, a very bad thing for the liver because it obstructs the blood flow back from the portal system. It's very different kind of injury from when we resect the liver and you get actual regeneration. And then the other one that you probably have heard about is called adhesions, and this occurs often in the chest and mostly in the abdomen. After surgery, if you open the abdominal cavity at all and handle anything, there'll be an insult and a very minor injury to the surface of the intestines, and that often heals by scarring. We call adhesions because they stick together. They, they form these scars, which may present no problem in the vast majority of the patients, but in some, those adhesions can get into a position where they form a barrier and don't allow things to slide and move in the normal way. They may cause a twist or a kink and end with an intestinal obstruction. So this can be a big problem, and we have not found a way to prevent adhesions. We've tried all kinds of chemicals, solutions, and protectants, but we're not able to prevent them any better than we were 100 years ago. Now, if we look at this next slide of the life cycle, this is one you've seen before. There are several categories of cells. We have what we call the labile tissues, which are continuously dividing throughout life. So they will cycle through. They'll spend a little time in some of these gap phases and then quickly come back in to make more cells. These are the endothelial tissues, the epithelial tissues we've talked about over and over again, the respiratory tract, the bone marrow, all new growth being derived in those tissues from the stem cells in the niches within that organ. The stable tissues, the ones that are quiescent and spend a lot of time resting out of the cycle, these include ones that can be upregulated when necessary, and these tend to stay in G0 until they're needed. Then they go back into G1 and start through their growth cycles again. And these include liver, kidney, pancreas, smooth muscle, and then as you saw in the last lecture, vascular endothelial cells, as well as the blood-forming elements. Notice that they're mostly mesothelial cells that fall into this category. Fibroblasts occur in areas of scar healing. They tend to be very quiet until they're needed. Now, then we have, again, the group of permanently non-dividing cells, such as neurons, as opposed to the glial cells we talked about, cardiac muscle, and even skeletal muscle. You know that the skeletal muscle can hypertrophy. Your muscles can get really strong pumping iron, but you'll still have the same number of the original kinds of cells you had. We do now know there's a limited ability for neurons to um, move up through the stem cell change, but very, very limited. And remember that all the replacement cells have to come from some form of stem cells that have maintained their housekeeping in the area of that organ. They're not going to come from far away, and they're probably well-determined cells. Let me talk to you now about wound healing. And what I would like to do is use the surgical wound or the traumatic wound as the prototype, but it applies to really every kind of wound healing. 
we have several kinds, and one we want to talk about is healing by primary intention. This means we take a relatively fresh wound and we close it together. And I probably should take a little aside time to tell you that there's something that really shocks all my first year medical students. We give them a workshop at the end of their first year, just before they go off into the rural communities to work with physicians. <clears throat> and we try to get them really competent at suturing wounds. We do this not on each other, but on uh, animal skins. And we give them a seminar on how to take care of wounds. And one of the things that always startles them is the fact that there's no incision, no wound in the whole world that has to be closed. We always think of the necessity to close wounds other than closing the chest so you can make a vacuum for the lungs or closing the abdomen so the guts aren't spilling out, which will cause rapid death. Other than that thin layer that has to maintain the integrity of a body ca a cavity, you don't have to close the rest of the wound. You can leave any wound open and allow it to heal in or close it at a later date. Students always like to say in our part of the world where there's a lot of outdoor life, what do you take in the wilderness? And they expect me to tell them which size needle holders, which size sutures, what kind of gauze, antibiotics, Novocaine, and I tell them to bring some soap and some gauze pads. Because even the worst wound, a grizzly bear bite versus falling off a, a cliff, when the wound is open, it can't really get infected. It can only get a surface infection, which isn't a problem. Once you've stopped the bleeding, all you have to do is wash that wound with soap and water, with betadine, with peroxide, whatever's handy, leave it open, pack it with some gauze pads, change them frequently, and wait till you get back to real medical help. To go about suturing in the wilderness is unnecessary and often a mistake. Because once you close the surface of that wound, then the bacteria are sealed in there and they can grow, create a wound infection, and where will you be 10 days later? You'll open the wound again, let it drain out, and now you'll be 10 days behind. So other than for cosmetic reasons and to return the patient to functionality quickly, primary closure is not necessary. And it's often risky you have to weigh the risks of closing that primary wound. So let's talk about primary closure. Now, suppose you have a wound that's nice and clean, you nicked yourself with a pocket knife or a razor, or a surgeon made an incision in your skin. We have lots of ways to close that wound. One of the oldest ways I've heard about and never seen was to take an ant, a really annoyed ant because you're holding him, hold the edges of the skin together in ancient times and let the annoyed ant bite the two pieces together and then cut off the ant's head. The jaws will stay in spasm and hold that wound together very nicely, probably leave very little scar. We've gone a little better than that now. We have for years used both absorbable and non-absorbable sutures, natural ones like cat gut, which doesn't come from a cat, it comes from a sheep. Um, and then braided or woven or monofilament plastics. And we like to go to the more synthetic ones because they don't invoke a very big inflammatory response. Gut, cat gut does because it's seen as a foreign protein from the sheep. And the monofilaments and polyfilaments, the same thing you have in a fishing line, elicits almost no response at all. Stainless steel staples, the titanium staples we use today, also are very non-reactive and are very good to use. And even the staples that are used internally to sew intestines together can be left forever. And the body does not recognize them as a foreign body. The immune system doesn't respond to them. The body actually doesn't know they're there. Today, we actually use superglue. Sterile superglue is available. It works instantly. You want to do this on a cooperative patient who will hold still because once you've touched the skin edges together, that's it. It's stuck, it's glued exactly where you put it. You can't cut out two stitches and redo it. So it's very nice in children of the age where they wouldn't like you to inject them and probably you'll lose their cooperation if you inject them with Novocaine, but also that can hold still enough, just long enough to touch those skin edges together.
Now, the steps in the healing process are several. They really begin in the first 24 hours. And this slide shows a wound healing by primary or first intention. And this represents a sharp incision. This distance really should represent about a millimeter or less. It looks much bigger um, than it should in real life. And in the first 24 hours, what would happen is exactly what you would expect knowing where we've come from. Those inflammatory cells, the polys, will come into the area from the capillaries. There'll be an appearance of some blood in the wound from the red cells that escaped. You remember seeing that in the first slides of the inflammatory response. And we'll get a clot in the wound called a fibrin clot. It starts with those platelets and then a whole cascade of clotting factors, which I alluded to when I talked to you about DIC, uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation. But here it's a controlled clot that will stop all the bleeding from the tiny, tiny capillaries and make things very, very sticky. This is good for a wound. It's nice for a wound to stick together and not move. And then the epithelial cells will begin almost immediately on the surface to come up from the basal cells down here where the stem cells are and try to cover this surface. They'll begin moving into the wound and the wound will be closed anatomically either by us pulling it together and letting ants bite it or by sewing it or by putting steri strips, little paper tapes, any way we can to close the wound after we've washed this out with soap and water people or, again, peroxide or betadine or anything you want. We don't like to put too many chemicals in here. If you have a choice, you're better just irrigating it with water. Betadine, soap, alcohol, tincture of iodine, which is alcohol, all damage more cells. So they may kill the bacteria, but then you'll get more cells in here, which makes you more susceptible. Today in surgery, we tend to irrigate with sterile saline. And then over the next several days, the polys go away. And if you remember how they go away, they die. And the macrophages eat them up. And then microvessels begin to appear down in here in the connective tissue. And they grow in as the angiogenic vessels do in a tumor cell. And collagen fibers start to go in, in the margin and the wound starts to close from the bottom, which is the way we like it to close uh, in an open wound. And by the end of the first week, it looks about like this. We may still have a little scab on the top that we can just see under a magnifying glass between the sutures. This is actually the weakest point in time of the whole wound experience. And then finally, fibrosis occurs and the wound continues to gain strength over many, many months and it will only achieve about 80% of its original strength. The skin, the normal collagen uh, that occurred will always be stronger than the wound scar. And although the scarring is an attempt to do it, uh, to get that strength back, it never succeeds quite as well as your own skin does. Skin, by the way, is very, very tough. We use a separate kind of needle to sew through skin that we do anywhere in the body because it's so hard to get through skin. Secondary intention is the same process, just takes longer. Same players, same characters are trying to get into this area, but it's a bigger area. It needs more time to heal. And um, it will usually occur with a depressed scar because this tissue tends to pull things down. In fact, when suturing skin, we try to actually bring the skin together and evert it just a tad. So that as the scar pulls on it, it comes out flat. If you sew skin together flat, it's probably gonna be pulled down and make a worse scar. The secondary intention is safe, and then we can do something called a delayed primary. We can lay this open for seven days or so, change dressings, and then bring the patient in and see if it's clean. If all the factors are there for nice, clean wound healing, we can then go ahead and make it a delayed primary instead of letting it fill in with scar, go ahead and close it. The factors that influence the way wounds heal 
or mechanics, whether it's a clean incision with a surgical scalpel or made by the jagged bottle in a bar. It's going to make a very different uh, incision and have more debris in the jagged wound or the traumatic wound. Motion and tension. Pulling on a wound creates more scar tissue, and so immobilizing these wounds is better for it. Infection rate, of course, will affect how a wound heals, and the blood supply. The nerve supply as well. Patients who are diabetic or who have had a nerve cut to an area have very poor wound healing. The diabetics have poor wound healing because they have a poor blood supply to that area, and they have a poor nerve supply to the area. So there are lots of factors that can affect it, but diabetes is really one of the most important. We're most careful surgically with um, diabetic wounds, and we like to take care of them either in the operating room or in trauma in the emergency room with extra care and detail to preventing infections, the use of antibiotics where we might not in another person. And here are all the the molecular and cellular things that are impaired in diabetes. We talked about chemotaxis, bringing the cells we need to the area in the inflammatory response. For some reason in diabetics, the phagocytes don't work as well. They're unable to eat as many of the germs as they need to. The whole inflammatory response is downregulated, and that's a negative thing for them. Wound healing in general because the vascularity is delayed and they have an inadequate microcirculation. You can feel the pulses in a diabetic's foot. They may have very strong normal pulses, but it's the capillary circulation that fails. And you can't see that very well. We only know that by the results. And increased infection rates, of course, break open all the wounds. Then we have to open them, treat the patient, and start again. There's lots of different ways to help unusual wounds, and some of the things we do are skin grafts. When we get big wounds, for example, in a burn, third degree burn we've talked about where all the regenerating cells are gone, and we need to cover that wound. One of the things we can do is take a split thickness skin graft, what we call an STSG. The split thickness skin graft means we come into a patient uh, who has some good areas that we can take skin from. For example, somebody who's burned their shoulder and we want to get some coverage on there, we can take skin off the thigh and we can cut it either by hand or with a special machine that's a little more precise and slice the skin to about 15 one thousandths of an inch. This will take those top epithelial cells that are alive not take the basal cells so that the patient will heal again. The stem cells are left behind and the patient will heal that area completely in only a few weeks. We take the free skin and then place it on the wound. Now the importance here is that skin never moves. It has to be sewn down and pre compressed with a dressing so that it doesn't shear across the surface. Because what we want that patient to do is to grow vessels up into the skin graft and make new skin. Now, you're gonna say, well, why doesn't the skin just die? But remember that a thin layer of cells, just like those cancer cells, can get nutrition from the surrounding fluid medium. And skin graft skin, especially in the bottom layers, can get some nutrition just from the weeping of plasma underneath. The top cells will often die and slough away, but in about five or six days, depending on where it is in the body, you can actually lift up the dressing and see the skin starting to turn pink. And if you press it and get a white spot, you'll see it fill again, and that's when you know your graft has been vascularized. So we do this in places that uh, we don't have a lot of motion. We don't like to do this over joints. We put split thickness skin over places that don't take a lot of trauma. For example, the forehead might be a place you might use it, the abdomen, the chest, where you're not constantly hitting it against something like your elbow. And um, these skin grafts always look like skin grafts. Cosmetically, they do not look like normal skin. They're thinner, they scar more, and they have some peculiar properties. I did a skin graft many years ago, 
with another surgeon who had this patient for many years in his practice and she had burn scars of the neck. And she had what we call contractures, burn scars tend to pull together and she could not raise her neck easily and she wanted that removed. It was very unsightly. It's that look you see, it's very pink, looks something like bubble gum. And we took her to the operating room and removed all the skin from her neck. It came right down to her clavicles and we removed the skin from her donor site, which was her thigh, uh, upper thigh. We took it where her bathing suit would cover that scar and um, got a perfect result. You rarely get a perfect result. You usually lose some percent of your skin graft, but this guy was very good and he, he just got a beautiful result. However, the patient came back in about two months later and said, this is awful. And she showed us her neck and she had grown fat in that neck. It turns out that skin is very specific. And all of you people say, I can never lose my fat on my thigh or I always gain weight on my abdomen are absolutely correct. The area of the body that tends to deposit fat tends to be very, very specific. And this poor woman had now a great chubby neck uh, because that's where she used to gain her uh, her weight, and even though it was unlikely we could ever get such a good result again, he actually did go back and took the graft from someplace in her body where she didn't tend to gain her weight, and again got a very nice result. So, as hard as it is to imagine, skin is very, very specific and has to be handled very carefully. The other kind of graft we use for wound healing, and I'm using this because I think it's a rather interesting one, is called a full thickness pedicle graft. If I take all the skin, full thickness surface with the stem cells at the bottom, some subcutaneous fat, and even occasionally muscle, which is what I would love to use to cover something like an elbow or a knee where it's going to have a lot of trauma, or the sole of the foot where you're going to be stepping on the skin. Split with thickness skin won't do it. We do a wonderful thing called a pedicle graft. And I've seen this actually used in patients in India where uh, the Indian bandits used to cut off people's noses as punishment. And this is a very deforming injury. I mean, it looks like a skeleton, a skull rather than a face. And you can't put th full thickness skin. These pedicle grafts were used from the forehead to make a new nose. And here's how they did it. If you have an open wound such as this, of whatever size it happens to be, and the muscle is showing and you're not going to get a good skin graft take on this. Um, what you do is you find an area next to that wound that has a good blood supply, and here's the main artery running through, and here's depicts the side blood supply to this. And you place this in proper skin lines for good cosmetics, and then you make a U-shaped incision all the way down for whatever thickness you want, usually all the way to the muscle, taking fat and everything with it. And then you rotate this graft laterally in this direction, keeping the base intact and off tension. And you lay it down across your open wound like this, and then sew the graft in place with sutures protecting the blood supply. This is going under the skin and you've kept a full thickness vascularized graft and then you pull this tissue together. You do some undermining to make it slide and it's under a little tension. It may even have a thicker scar, but now you've accomplished a wonderful thing. You've closed this and you can actually take graft as this doctor did, a plastic surgeon from India, and he would remove skin from the forehead and march it down and create a whole new nose. We, you can do this on your hands where you need full thickness skin from one finger and move it on to another finger, finger keeping them together with the pedicle of uh, vascularity intact. This is probably the most advanced kind of surgery for big, big wound problems. Well, that brings us to the end of how we heal and how we take care of wounds and how we take care of our bodies. I hope you've learned enough to stimulate your uh, in inquisitiveness and take what obviously was a very quick look at all these subjects so that you'll be able to go back and find areas of special interest,
and learn more about these subjects. Thank you for coming.